Welcome, and again, this session we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be talking about the parable of the wedding feast, a question about taxes, the question about rising from the dead, the resurrection and marriage. We're going to be talking about the greatest commandment and also whose son is the Messiah. Let's get right into this. Uh, verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a wedding feast for his son. He went out, or he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My cattle and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they made light of it and went their ways. One to his own farm, another to his merchandise, and the rest grabbed his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. Why would you kill someone who's inviting you to a feast? But again, why would you kill somebody who preaches righteousness to you? Why would you hate anybody that preaches righteousness to you? It preaches against sin. It's only for your own, it's for your own good. It's for your own soul. Verse 7. When the king heard that, he was angry and sent his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited weren't worthy. Hmm. Not worthy. Why weren't they worthy? They made light of it. They didn't take it very seriously. They were too busy with their life. Please, my friend, don't do that when it comes to God. Don't do that when it comes to the scriptures. Take it very seriously. Where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? Verse 9. Go, therefore to the intersections of the highways, and as many as you may find, invite them to the wedding feast. So this is going to the, the, the main discourses of the city, going to where all the people are, going to the, 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 the heavily, heavily trafficked areas. Those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. The wedding was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man who didn't have on wedding clothing. He said to him, friend, how did you come in here not wearing wedding clothing? And he was speechless. When the king said, then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and throw him into the outer darkness. For those of you who know the scriptures well enough, you know that the term outer darkness almost always refers to hell. This is where the weeping and grinding of teeth will be. For many are called, but few chosen. So what's the difference between those who are called and those who are chosen? Let's let's look over this one more time. He called, he, he had a whole bunch of people that he originally had on his, on his wedding list. They weren't worthy to come to the wedding. He said, forget about them. Leave them. Let, let them. let them go to hell. More or less, go to hell. You see, this is a parable of the kingdom of heaven. This is a parable of being invited to heaven. But those who do not take the word of God seriously... Those who do not take the scripture seriously, those who do not take God seriously, those who do not take repenting of their sins seriously, would not be worthy. It just won't be worthy. God will God will just leave you behind. So then his servants went out you know these they got some of them got killed so then finally you know the the uh the king which is you know again this is um, a picture of god 
said, you know, go out basically into the highways, into the byways, go out into the highly trafficked areas, to the main discourses of the city and, and compel everybody to come in. So they brought in people. However, there was people there, at least one person there, which it could be symbolic of a whole group of people, that didn't have on wedding clothes. What does that mean? That means he was not properly prepared. That means he did not really repent of his sins and get cleansed. He was still filthy. When he was confronted, he couldn't say anything because he knew that he was guilty. What, did ha what happened to him? He ended up in hell. Threw him into outer darkness. He didn't even have a second chance. The king could have said, oh, okay, take this guy. Oh, I'm sorry. This guy came in. You know, just, just wash up his clothes and let him stay here. You know, wash it up. Wash, get him to wash up and he'll stay. No, no. Many times, God doesn't give second chances. In certain, certain, certain circumstances, he doesn't. Actually, I should say many circumstances, he doesn't. It's appointed unto man once to die, it says. And then after that, the judgment. Many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? It means God is calling many people to repent. The ones who are chosen are the ones who actually do get cleaned up. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called to the wedding feast, but the chosen ones are the ones who take it seriously and come with prepared. They come prepared. They don't come with filth, filthy clothes. They come clean. And that's what you need to do. Come clean with God. Verse 15, Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how they might entrap him in his talk. Oh, let's see if we can get him on something here. Oh, let's see if we can trick him here. Trap him. They sent their disciples to him. The Pharisees, that is. You need to understand that back in those days, it wasn't unusual for a rabbi to have disciples. You know, every rabbi, even today, a lot of Jewish rabbis have disciples. Okay? So, I mean, some Christians think that, you know, there's, there's Jesus and the disciples. And that's the only... Jesus and the disciples, that's the only person that had real, really had disciples back in those days. No, every rabbi had disciples. The Pharisees had disciples. They sent their disciples to him, to Jesus, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, Rabbi, we know that you are honest. Here we go with the buttery talk. Here we go with the nicey-nicey talk, you know, kissing them, hugging them. Oh, nice to see you there, Jesus. How people do in church, you know, smile and shake your hand, and then afterwards they stab you in the back. Teacher, we know that you are honest and teach the way of God in truth. Oh, look how pretty they talk. No matter whom you teach, for you aren't partial to anyone. Oh, see? See how good, how nicey, nicey they talk, don't they? They're really buttering him up. They're really just, they're really just praising him, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Trickery. That's what a lot of people are into. The trickery. They talk nice. They kiss you. They hug you. They shake your hand. They smile. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness. That's what you got to do in life. When you go to church, the pastor, the church people, the people who smile at you, the people that are syrupy sweet with you, you've got to watch out for them. You've got to really watch out for those people, especially the ones that are really nice to you. Watch out for them. Jesus wasn't a fool. He perceived their wickedness. He didn't say, oh, it's so good that you're so nice and finally someone is praising me. Finally someone is saying that I preach the truth. Oh, thank you for saying that I'm honest. Thank you for saying that I, that I preach the truth. Thank you that you, that for saying that, I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't play favorites. You know, uh, uh, Thank you for coming to me and asking me this great question. This is awesome. Thank you for acknowledging me and, and, and acknowledging my, my, my wisdom and, and, and expertise in this area. 
He could have said that. But it says he perceived their wickedness. And he said to them, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Uh, again, oh, so, just basically sucker punched him more or less. <laughs> Jesus more or less just sucker punched him. Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. They brought him a denarius. You know, we know that a denarius was worth about a day's wages. He asked him, he said, whose image is on this? Whose image in, in, in inscription? They said to him, Caesar's. He said to them, give, to, give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and left him and went away. So that's what you should do. I pray that every one of you listening to me, I pray that everybody here within the sound of my voice has wisdom of God, so much so that your enemies can't even answer you. It's either they repent, they change their mind, they change their life, or they just get out of your life <laughs> like they did here. They walked away. They couldn't answer him. Verse 23, on that day, Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him. Now, let me just make it clear here. We have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees are the ones who believe in the entire Tanakh and the oral laws, the oral traditions, and all that kind of stuff, okay? The Pharisees believe in all of the Jewish law, plus the, you know, the scriptures and all this kind of stuff and all, all those observances, the, the, you know, uh, the oral law, the written law, all of the Torah, Nevi'im, Ketavim, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, everything. Uh, the Sadducees only believe in the Torah. Only believe in the Torah. Okay? So, that's why they say there's no resurrection, because they, they did not understand, they did not, they did not really understand that the Torah actually does speak of the resurrection. Okay? It says the Sadducees didn't believe in angels either. That's why, because they didn't they didn't really see angels spoken of too much in the Torah. But you see, rightly looking at it, giving them the benefit of the doubt, the Torah was instantly canonized, so to speak. We had the whole nation was was there, and the Torah was given publicly. I mean, they all saw the glory of God. They saw the presence of God. They heard the voice of God. They had to say, finally, they had to say, Mo, Moshe, go and you talk to God. We can't stand to hear the voice of God any longer. We can't stand this presence. We can't stand this glory. We can't stand it. Nobody doubted. Nobody disbelieved. The Torah, the written Torah, instantly canonized. Instantly canonized. Nobody said, is it the word of God or is it not? Is it inspired or is it not? Now, the prophets, the so-called Old Testament prophets, the, the Ketavim, the writings, the historical writings, the Psalms and Proverbs and such, they weren't officially considered to be official word of God scripture until much later. Okay, so give the Sadducees a little bit of benefit of the doubt here. That's the reason why they didn't believe in resurrection. The Bible doesn't say it. Like how a lot of Christians are today. They're just like the Pharisees. You tell them something, well, where do you see that in the Bible? Well, where do you see that in the Bible? Where do you see this in the Bible? No, it's just like the Pharisees. Resurrection, where, where, do, where do you see this in the Torah? Where do you see that in the Torah? Angels, where do you see there? Where do you, where do you see angels in the Torah? They asked him, saying, Teacher, they, the Sadducees, asked him, saying, Teacher, Rabbi, Moshe said if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Or seed. You see how important it was for people to have children? It says if, if a brother didn't have children when he died, his, his brother is supposed to marry his wife and have children 
for him. So it was very, very important for a brother to have seed, okay? To have, to have children, you know? So the Sadducees said, testing Jesus, of course, they said, now there was, uh, there were with us seven brothers. The first married and died, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. In the same way, the second also, and the third, and to the seventh. After, after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, of course, now see, this is, this is tricky. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will she, will she be of the seven? See, they didn't even believe in the resurrection anyway. They were just more or less just mocking Jesus. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered them and said, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Whoa, what an insult that is. Not only are you mistaken, you missed it. You don't know the scriptures. What? We're a Sadducee. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. You're ignorant. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like God's angels in heaven. But concerning the re resurrection of the dead, haven't you read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? And that is obviously in the Torah. Hello, Sadducees, Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob. God is not God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitudes heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But the Pharisees, when they heard it, when they heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, okay, when the fair, let me see this again, verse 34, but, but the Pharisees, when they heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, gathered themselves together, like, wow, Yeshua, he made the, he, he, he shut them up. He zipped the Sadducees' lips for him. He shut them up. He silenced them. Wow, what a miracle. Verse 35, one of them, a lawyer, asking him a question, testing him, says, Teacher, Rabbi, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, once again, Jesus had all the opportunity to say anything he wanted to here. Okay? If this, if this particular lawyer asked a, a Christian leader today, which of the commandments is of more importance and more authority? A lot of Christian, a lot of Christian leaders would say, "Well, they're all the same. You break one, you break them all. All the commandments are on the same level. You know, if you if you come and and bring a lamb to the, you know, to 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 be sacrificed, and it's got one black hair on it. You know, it's not spotless." And you're guilty of murdering a million people. I, obviously, this is nonsense, you know. They don't understand the context or the, the generalities that uh, James chapter 2 was speaking about. But that's another thing. We'll get to there. We'll get to that. So Jesus could have said, what do you mean greatest commandment? They're all, they're all of equal importance. They're all equal. All the commandments are, are equal. They're all equal in, 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 in their level. You can't have one commandment that's it's greater than another. He could have said that. Verse 37, Jesus said to them, You shall love the, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Deuteronomy 6.5. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 6. He's quoting from the Torah. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Now, you notice this is the first and the greatest commandment. We, we just talked um, um, there last session 
in Matthew chapter 21 how ancient biographies are not necessarily chronological. And the Torah also. The scriptures also. It's not necessarily chronological. The first and greatest commandment isn't the first verse of the first book. The first and greatest commandment is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And the second is like is like this, is this, okay? So Jesus didn't leave the first. Uh, the lawyer asked him, which is the greatest? But Jesus didn't leave it at just one. He had to bring in the second one too. So the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second, he always tags, the second it's, always comes with the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Again, you think that maybe the second commandment would be listed right after the first commandment in the Torah. No, no, no. It's not even in the same book. Verse 40, the whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Now, another, another uh, translation says the whole law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You know, I once spoke to a, a gentleman who believed that this is all you had to do. is just love the Lord and love your neighbor and you don't have to obey any commandments. Can anybody spell stupid? Seriously. Can anybody spell stupid? Jesus made it clear, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love the Lord your God, you will obey his commandments. Verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think of the Christ? <laughs> ah, you see, you know, Jesus was on this kind of, uh, it was quite a relationship Jesus had here with the Pharisees. You know, he kind of, you know, here we got a little, he just kind of leaned over at one time and just said to him, Hey, Pharisees, what do you think of the Mashiach, the Messiah? Whose son is he? Ho, ho, ho. What a great question from the Messiah himself, from the Christ himself. What do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? hi ya ha What a question that is. Heavy one, boys, heavy one. They said to him, David, of David, son of David. See, the, the term son of David means Messiah. It just refers to Messiah. Verse 43, he said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? If, if the Messiah is his son, if David's son is the Messiah, if David is the father of the Messiah, why does he call his, his son Lord? Saying, Verse 44, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for, for your feet. That's in Psalm 110, verse 1. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word. Neither did any man dare ask him any more questions from that day forward. Wow. Awesome. And may you go with wisdom like Jesus, wisdom like Yeshua, that would silence your enemies, silence the Sadducees in your life. Silence them by asking them such good questions of great wisdom powerful questions that they, they, would just, they just won't even know what to think. They'll just walk away. May God enlighten the eyes of your heart. May God bless your ears to hear, your eyes to see as you meditate upon his scriptures as you're commanded to. Thanks again.